I'd like to begin with a story, and it's a sobering story. In the early morning hours one day in May 2015, FBI agents raided the home of physics professor, Temple University physics professor, Xiaoxing Shi. After rounding up his wife and daughters at gunpoint, they arrested Professor Shi and accused him of sharing sensitive technology with researchers in China. The indictment threatened him with some 80 years in prison. And as news of these accusations spread, Temple University uh, suspended him from his position. It suspended him as chair as well of the uh, physics department. Four months later, the case collapsed. All charges were dropped. It turned out that Professor Shi hadn't shared information about sensitive technology. He had actually just emailed colleagues in China about an entirely different technology that was public and that he himself had invented. But after four months of being labeled publicly and castigated as a threat to security and as an enemy of the state, as a spy for China, he sought to clear his name. So he filed suit in federal court against the FBI agents uh, who had been involved with the investigation. And what he argued is that this wasn't simply an honest mistake about technology. Actually, the FBI agents, he argued, had knowingly fabricated evidence in his case and thought of him as a threat, presumed that he was threatening, in part because of his Chinese origin. The federal trial court last year refused even to hear these claims. It described what happened to Professor Xi as unfortunate, but it said that he could not bring these claims for damages against federal officials for violating his constitutional rights. Because his case implicated national security, he could not have his day in court. I want to talk to you about how courts have barred many victims of government misconduct from holding security agencies accountable, and why that challenges our collective aspirations for racial justice. You may recall that in 2017, many Americans flocked to airports around the country to protest the Trump administration's travel ban, blocking citizens from several majority Muslim countries from entering. But when the Supreme Court took up the issue a year later, it upheld the ban. And it essentially ruled that despite any evidence of religious bias, it would not closely examine that evidence to determine whether bias was the real motivation behind the government policy. Instead, the inquiry ended because the government proffered up a security reason for the policy. And courts should defer on matters of national security and immigration. Often, when the government invokes national security, courts do not even reach the legal questions at hand. But instead, based on threshold determinations, they refuse to let those cases proceed. So several years earlier, a number of human rights organizations and media outlets had challenged a new law that authorized rather sweeping surveillance of people overseas. But the court ruled that they could not bring that legal challenge because they could not prove that they were being surveilled. The problem, of course, is that by definition, surveillance happens in secret. So this makes it nearly impossible to contest such a law. So I will circle back now to the legal decisions over the last few years that have made it so difficult for someone like Professor Xi to advance his case. Over the last five years, the Supreme Court has nearly eliminated the ability of individuals to bring claims for damages against federal agents for violating their constitutional rights. So last spring, the court ruled that a US citizen who alleged that a border patrol agent beat him up on his own property inside the United States could not bring a claim, and moreover, that no one could assert a constitutional damages claim against a federal border patrol agent. Why? 
because border patrol is related to national security. But consider for a moment just how expansive this interpretation of national security is. Border Patrol is one of the largest law enforcement agencies in the country. Border Patrol agents often police alongside state and local police in the vast regions near Canada and Mexico, well in, inside the interior. In recent years, Border Patrol agents have been sent to do things like quash police protests in Portland or surveil the funeral of George Floyd. So in adopting such an expansive conception of national security, the court threatens to extend deference to a wide swath of law enforcement activities well inside US borders. Now, legal scholars, including myself, have critiqued many of the rationales advanced for this broad form of judicial deference. We have argued that courts have a constitutional obligation to intervene and review cases implicating individual rights. We have argued that courts have the expertise to manage and protect any legitimately sensitive information that these cases implicate. But the problem is not just that these rationales for judicial deference are overbroad. The fallout from national security deference often lands hardest on racial, ethnic, and religious communities often characterized as security threats. National security deference strips protection from the very groups least likely to be protected in majoritarian political processes, especially in times of heightened geopolitical tension or when political opportunists stoke public fear. We imagine that an idea like national security transcends internal divisions. But race has often shaped who we consider the nation to be protected and who we define as outsiders to that nation. The court at one point used to link race and security rather explicitly. So in the late 19th century, in deferring to the political judgment of the government that the very presence of non-white foreigners constituted a threat, the court excluded or upheld the exclusion of Chinese immigrants from the US. Later, the court once again deferred in uh, upholding the military orders leading to the internment of over 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. And it deferred to the judgment of the military authorities, despite the fact that those authorities had openly called Japanese Americans an enemy race whose very customs and religion indicated their disloyalty. In our own time, despite the progress we have made towards racial equality, race and identity continue to shape our visions and policies on security. They are part of the reason that we have now a 20-year global war on terror in over 80 countries around the world and why we continue to have intensive surveillance and profiling of Muslim Americans here at home. Race, likewise, is part of the reason that for many years our political leaders and security agencies downplayed the threat of violence from white nationalists and anti-government paramilitary groups, which, of course, culminated when such groups joined others in the siege on the Capitol on January 6th. Now, I have argued in my academic work that this inequality in treatment is not a reason to ratchet up or expand what might be misguided or overbroad terrorism and security policies. But it is a reason to reform frameworks that essentially shield law enforcement agencies and security agencies from public knowledge and oversight. So I end with a final message from the US Supreme Court. The court itself used to warn that national security concerns must not become a talisman 
used to ward off inconvenient claims, a label used to cover a multitude of sins. I hope all of us and our courts take that message to heart. Thank you.